Welcome to season four of the Today is a Good Day podcast, a podcast to bring you a new point of support as you navigate your NICU journey. This season, you will hear even more personal stories from families who have been where you are today. Some of the stories you will hear will provide you with important advice from medical professionals like case managers and high-risk OBGYNs. You will also hear advice about opportunities you can take to focus on self-care and more. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Today is a Good Day podcast wherever you enjoy your podcast or share this episode with anyone who might find it helpful. We hear about case managers supporting families in the NICU, but what is the role of a case manager and when do you need one? Also, what are social determinants of health and how do they impact a family navigating the NICU? We will hear answers to these questions and more with our guest today. Madeline Zabo is the Senior Vice President of Clinical Operations at Progeny Health, a national healthcare company dedicated to maternity and NICU care management. The company serves women, infants, caregivers, and families through the milestones of maternal health, from conception and pregnancy to postpartum and parenting, with special expertise in managing premature and complex births and resulting NICU admissions. With over 25 years' experience in the managed care arena, Madeline has developed a keen understanding of key aspects of the healthcare industry. Prior to joining Progeny Health, she served as Regional Director and Associate Vice President with both Molina Healthcare and Aetna. In these roles, Madeline developed and implemented programs to support lines of business that included commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid membership. Madeline earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Bloomsburg University. Grateful to have you here with us today, Madeline. Welcome. Thank you, Martha. It's great to be here. Well, I know I shared a little bit about your impressive background and all that you have done to help so many families, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. What inspired you to get into this line of work? Sure. So I was, uh, I am a registered nurse by training and I did my clinical training at, uh, most of my clinical uh, started at Shriners Hospital in the Philadelphia unit. And I, um, that was a specialty for pediatric orthopedics and spinal cord injury. And I did that for about seven years. And it's that rehab aspect of that specialty is kind of hard on the body. And so it was uh, about seven years into that part of my career when I decided that I needed to look for a different avenue and uh, use my clinical in a different way. And so that's where I found managed care and went to be a case manager for one of the local health plans here in the outside of the Philadelphia area. That's where I learned how to do case management really and to be a case manager and help families. At that time, I was uh, helping adults in um, acute medicine environments. So uh, yeah, and so now it's, it's very rewarding really to just help families become more informed about what's going on with them in their health during critical times. And it's just a very rewarding aspect of nursing. Well, and I think hearing you talk about this, I mean, case manager, case management, those are terms that are thrown around that we hear uh, often. But I don't, you know, help us understand what they actually mean. And especially related to the NICU experience, Mm -hmm. How and when do case managers get involved in a NICU case? Sure. It's a multifaceted specialty, I would say, of nursing. Um, There are also uh, folks in case management that are not nurses. Social workers, for example, may be in um, case management. And in particular with the NICU, our case management program is um, we outreach to families while they're admitted into the NICU. So as early as possible after that admission into the NICU is when we are outreaching to families to get connected with them in order to uh, really help them to navigate through that complicated process, which, you know, as you know, and and your listeners know, can be an extremely, uh, it's overwhelming. It can be long. So case managers get involved with families uh, very early on in that admission uh, to the NICU, as early as possible. 
And the reason we do that is because our role is to really help to be facilitators and navigators, and most especially advocates for families while they're going through that inpatient stay. And during that inpatient stay, the case manager's focus is really around uh, the discharge plan and how can we help to assure that the family understands the plan of care, the treatment course, what is their role as um, their, their infant moves through that continuum of an inpatient stay? And then how do we get that family ready really for discharge? And that's where we collaborate with the hospital discharge planners and the hospital case management program along with the, with the families so that we are getting them ready to take their infant home. Which is a huge milestone, as we all know, exciting mm-hmm. and scary day all together in wrapped up in one little package as we head out of the NICU. I guess my question for you, Progeny Health works with some families, insurance, hospitals, but what if, uh, what if a family doesn't have access to the Progeny Health providers but does want to ask their hospital about working with a case manager? Who would a family contact at their hospital to see if a case manager is even available? Best place to start is with your primary nurse, right? There's usually a primary nurse who is working with that family in um, in the NICU, and that nurse is going to be the one who's going to be able to know how to connect you with the resources in the hospital. Sometimes case management resources in the hospital are referred to as, as case managers. Sometimes it's discharge planners. Sometimes the social worker acts as the case manager in, in that role of case manager. And so um, really the, the person who is um, sort of leading that care for that family who is their primary connecting point, I would start there and have them help you to get connected to the case management department so that they can make a referral and and have somebody come in and talk to the family and let them know what services they provide and how they can help to support the family throughout this process. Madeline, do you think it would also make sense for families to reach out to their insurance provider if they have private insurance to reach out and say, hey, I'm looking for more resources. Can you help guide me in the right direction? Absolutely. Um, Most health insurance plans have case management departments and, um, you know, the way they determine what patients are eligible, they call their um, patient members, are eligible for case management is through a, a triggering event. And a NICU admission is certainly a triggering event for most health plans, case management programs. And so, yes, and the way I would recommend that a listener would get in touch through for that um, referral into the health plan is through their member services. And usually that information is on the back of their insurance card and they can contact member services and just let them know that they'd like to be referred for a case management referral and see if they, uh, so that they can have a call with someone to see how they may uh may qualify. Yeah, that's a good resource to think about. That back of the health insurance card, always good to read that and to give a call to the number for sure. And I guess as we're talking about a NICU stay, you know, our family knows personally from our experience nearly 12 years ago, it is overwhelming. It is filled with anxiety for families and they might not fully understand everything that is happening. That's really part of the reason we started the Today is a Good Day podcast because we look back at questions that we had, resources we didn't know were available, even what questions we should be asking. So you as a case manager working with NICU families, what do you think are some of the most important questions for families to ask, either at the beginning of their NICU journey, as they, if they're in an extended stay, what should they be asking? Uh, I agree with you that, uh, you know, just not fully understanding the healthcare uh, arena is so hard to navigate, whether you're, you know, in in a NICU or an adult who has um, inpatient uh, people within the inpatient stay. I think some of the questions that um, I would suggest that the listeners uh, ask are around um, what is the goal? What is the plan? And that question can get down to, in the NICU, it comes down to, you know, what is the plan in the next hour? 
right? It could be to that granular level. What is the plan today? What is the plan with this treatment that you're recommending for my child? And and then the other thing I think that's really important is understanding expectations. As a parent in the NICU, their child in the NICU, what do you expect of me as this child's parent, right? So that everybody's on the same uh, playing field, I think, is... um, it just helps everybody to really, it helps to open the lines of communication. And, and I know we say this and it's so cliche that no question is a, is a bad question. I think though there's um, expectations that parents may have that they should know everything, right? And absolutely, you shouldn't know everything. You, you should just be um, able, be there to, to just take care of your, your baby. And uh, so I think, I think that really comes about just asking about the goal and the and the plan and and go from there. And we talk a lot about jotting down those questions as you think of them. We talk about journaling a lot, being an advocate, getting those questions out of your mind and down on a piece of paper so that mm-hmm. when you call the NICU or when you go in for a visit that you have those questions front and center and don't forget to ask them. The other question I have for you though is do you have a way that you encourage families to really feel as though they are a part of the care team? Because I think it can be overwhelming to ask the questions. I mean, I I look back and I think, oh goodness, the neonatologists and the nurses had to be nervous coming to talk to Paul and me because we had that journal open, pen ready, every time they did Mm -hmm. Claire's daily report. And we wanted to jot down, we were trying to understand. And if we didn't understand, we'd say, can you say this in a different way? Right. But how do you get them to be a part of the care team more or what what should parents be asking the medical providers in the hospital? Well, I think really placing yourself in and and recognizing that you are a very intricate part of that care team. And it may take, you know, several attempts, right, to get yourself in. Um, And it's really about finding that advocate, that person that is going to help you. I think about it, you know, as when I was practicing in nursing at the bedside, um, the doctors would come in, they do their quick thing and they go out and, and then the nurses came in behind and helped to make sure that the family understood the lingo. They understood what was um, being said, what the plan was. And so I, I really think it's about finding that person in the care team. And, you know, again, I go back to nursing because I'm partial to nurses since I am one. Um, but I really think that it is our job uh, to to help in the moment during that time when that family is asking those questions. And then actually the case managers are there also. When you are connected with a case manager, they're another great resource because they are part of that care team. And so they're tracking what is the plan, what is going on, and you know what is the next milestone for this child and for this family so that um, they can move that baby along and um, and have everybody be ready for what needs to happen in order to have them be able to go home. And we do know that every NICU journey is different. Every family's experience is different. I want to change topics a little bit here, but we we hear a lot about social determinants of health and how that impacts families. And I was hoping you could give us a better understanding of what that means, social determinants of health, and how your team at Progeny helps to address the these concerns. Sure. Social determinants of health is uh, certainly a buzzword in the uh, health industry. It has been for years, but I think it's getting even more recognition today as we also pair that with uh, health equality and health inequity. But social determinants of health, if I had to boil it down, it really is about um, an individual's personal circumstances that impact their health and their ultimate then well-being. And it includes uh, socioeconomic indicators, education, cultural, um, political, and those things come alongside things like access to health care. How easy is it for someone to um, have a 
pediatrician in the in the area where they live? How easy is it for them to get there? Transportation. Um, and then once they are there, their education level and how what is their health literacy is what that's called when you understand the um, the lingo and the 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 uh, all the terms that come about when you are in a doctor's office or a hospital setting. And so um, those are all of the things that really are what social determinants are talking about. And so what we do and what any case manager does is really do an assessment of a family's social determinants of health. What is it that is not necessarily the medical um side of what's going on with them but what is all what is all the other stuff that's going into how they are reacting to what's happening to them and then how do you bring that um how do you solve for them and so it's called gaps in care how do you solve the gaps that may be um, associated with those social determinants of health so that you can close the gap and we do that by referring people to resources such as today is the good day right or maybe they need help uh, with the transportation and so we connect them with uh, transportation services whether it be through their health plan or through a community resource or make making sure they have a family member that can help them uh, to get to appointments. And so, um, you know, is English your primary language? I mean, that's another thing, right? Uh, how, how do you, what does your culture say to you about how you handle health? You know, we can't go into uh, situations and believe that everybody's the same because we're obviously not. And it's meeting a family where they are and helping them to solve those um, barriers that may be keeping them from having um, a positive outcome and a and a healthy outcome. And if families don't have access to a social worker at this time or aren't working with Progeny or, or another group to help them with these resources, where should they turn to at the hospital to try and get connected with resources that would help them? I think one of the best places for them to get connected in the hospital is to ask to speak to their social worker. Um, who there? I would think it would be very unusual that a NICU um, baby doesn't have a social worker assigned, um, or a or a case manager assigned. Now, some hospitals um, they assign those individuals at certain times throughout, you know, the course of the stay. But I think the earlier that the family can ask to speak to that resource, and then um, work with them. They'll, they'll set up an assessment and, and just don't be overwhelmed. They ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. a lot of questions. And it's really not to be prying. They're really looking to try and help understand that family situation. Every family is unique, as you've mentioned. And so uh, that social work or that case manager is going to be able to um, really help to advocate on the family's behalf and make sure that those needs are are being met. And I'm sure you've, just like you mentioned, today is a good day. You all have built an incredible network of community partners that you work with. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the community partners that you work with in and around the Philadelphia area and, above, and beyond? Sure. <clears throat> the, um, the ideal goal is to connect families to local resources, right? So, um, in the in the Philadelphia area, there's there's just so many. Uh, we connect families with uh, Lily's Hope, um, the Superhero Project at Chop is another one uh, that has just been a great partner for us, and um, allows our team to make referrals for families that um, need the kinds of support that they provide, and then. You know, really at a national level, some of the national organizations also have that local connection as well. So the Salvation Army, for example, uh, they're extremely helpful when it comes to um, uh, helping with financial support for things like utility bills. Um, the local the local utility companies uh, as well. Uh, Feeding America is another one. Progeny works very closely with Feeding America, and we're very proud of our relationship with that organization. And um, 
we've been able to have uh, support to food banks in the uh, local areas where the members that we manage live. And so that's just us being able to give back to help to continue the great work that that many of these organizations do. And you support families across the country, right? We do. We are a national organization and we have clients all over the country. And um, those clients, uh, members live in, in, in those different states all over, all over the country. Now, you all also have quite a bit of experience and special expertise in helping families and infants affected by neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? We know it's something that we hear often, that it's a, a struggle. How do you respond? Sure. sure. So um, neonatal abstinence syndrome and and more frequently now it's referred to as neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is the syndrome and condition that is um, given to an infant when they are born uh, because they were exposed to opioids in, in utero, in, in the womb. And so prior to their being born and once they're born, they no longer have that source of um, the drug. The drugs do cross the placental um barrier. And so that baby has that drug in their, in their bloodstream. And so after they're born and they don't have that, um, anymore, they go through withdrawal, just like an adult who's taking drugs and then they don't take drugs, um, would withdraw. And so babies have, uh, symptoms of withdrawal. They can be, um, extremely irritable and, and difficult to console. They may have sleep issues. And so, um, Our teams are uh, trained in uh, management of babies with neonatal um, abstinence syndrome, as well as our medical directors are all neonatologists and um, practicing neonatologists. And so they've had experience in this area. And so really our goal in working with families where the baby has been um, exposed is, is twofold. It's one, to make sure that the infant's care plan is consistent with, you know, evidence-based management um, of how they, they basically wean the baby off of, um, off of the medications, just to make that withdrawal a, a easier process for them. And then also our focus shifts very quickly to the mother. If a mother is taking drugs during her pregnancy and she wants help and needs help, then our goal too is to make sure that um, she's referred to appropriate programs. Again, if there's health insurance involved, usually through the health insurers uh, programs, are they're able to be referred and have um, case management s- uh, services. So we're connecting them to services to help them with their manage their their drug problem. And have you seen families affected by this increase over the past number of years? We have. Um, you know, the opioid epidemic is a is a national crisis. It's worse, of course, in some states than others. Um, but I think we've learned over time that um, it's not limited to one socioeconomic um, area. It is. It is prevalent throughout our um, our country, and I think we also have seen instances through um, you know coming out of a of a pandemic, where um, you know there was even a spike in in utilization of of substance and um, abuse of substance. So um, it is it is prevalent in every um, every state. We see it in with basically every client we've seen infants. Um, born with abstinence syndrome. Thank you for sharing more about that and wonderful that you are are helping to connect families with resources. And I have to say, I mean, Progeny has done so much for so many NICU families in many different areas. And I know one of the areas that you are very passionate about is around health inequities. And knowing that Black mothers, for example, have three times the rate of maternal morbidity than white women you all have worked on this a lot. Can you tell us what you're doing to help level the playing field for all individuals in this space? This has really been um, an issue that has um, our founder, Ellie Stang, has been very passionate about uh, from the beginning before it even you know, started to to really take hold in, in uh, the media and what, and what we hear about now, right? Um, 
And it's really about, so just so people understand what health inequity is, is it's it's where there are different outcomes because of what color your skin is or what part of the country you live in or what your um, level of understanding is. So again, some of those social determinants of health go along with health equity and health inequity. And really, um, as a society, we should be blind to that, right? We really should be blind to that. And that is the approach that progeny takes. While we um, certainly need to understand how race and ethnicity and culture impacts um, your health as, a, as an individual or your family's health or this, this baby's health when it comes to NICU babies, um, it really shouldn't matter how we refer you um, to resources or connect you to resources. It should be standard care for all mothers, for all infants, regardless of the color of your skin or what part of the country you live in. And so um, our case managers assess uh, the needs and work to solve any gaps that we come across through those assessments. And um, we work to facilitate and educate families about um, getting connected to those resources, why it's important, and then how do we help them to uh, sustain that um, connectivity and connection to those resources as until their you know, problems are solved and they're, um, they've got good connections. Really incredible to hear. And I know I've read different articles that Dr. Stang has written and connected with her and just read all that Progeny is doing. So thank you for sharing on so many levels today. I mean, we've talked about quite a bit. And I I think the, the case management piece, I know we touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but just can you share again, how can families access their case management services, which would help them in some of these different areas that we've discussed throughout this whole episode? So the connection for case management, I think it depends on where you're at in your child's journey, right? So let's talk about it from an inpatient perspective, right? The the goal for connection at, um, for case management is early as early as possible. If someone offers you case management, say yes. At least listen and hear them out. You might think you don't need it. You might think, oh, I'm a nurse. I'm, I, know, I know what I need to do. I'm a nurse. And I'll tell you, I, I need support too when, when family, start, you know, family members or friends are in um, hospital situations. So I think it's first get connected, ask to be assigned a case manager, and you ask that question through either your primary nurse, your attending physician, uh, your social worker in the hospital. Many of those um, departments are um, together, case management, discharge planning, social work. And so I think that's one thing is to, to start there and be sure that you um, can get connected while you're inpatient. If you are already discharged, right? I'm sure you have families who listen to your podcast and um, they didn't know to ask and they're already home. Uh, we talked about that you can connect through health services. Um, I'm sorry, health insurance uh, services. So many health, most of the health insurers, especially the, um, the big ones, offer case management services. And so uh, one of the ways you would access those services is to use the member services phone number on the back of your insurance card and call member services and let them know that you would like to uh, be referred for case management. And what I'm hearing you say, too, is that you can even call post-discharge to ask Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I mean, because sometimes you can be in the NICU for a very short time, right? You could be in five, six days, um, or you could be in months. Uh, as we know, the continuum is vast. And so... Once you're, um, and, and even if you're inpatient, you can also contact your health insurance, um, you know, whatever or where you're enrolling the baby as well, whatever health plan you're enrolling your, um, your baby into, that's where you want to make that phone call and ask to be referred for case management services. And then typically what happens is somebody will reach out telephonically and uh, do an assessment and determine what your needs are and see how they can help you. Well, something that sticks out to me that you said is say yes 
to help. Yeah. And I think that is really hard for people to do. I mean, we talk about it on frequently past episodes of this podcast, just with conversations that we have with families involved with today is a good day. It is hard to ask for the help and sometimes to even know to ask for the help. I mean, Paul and I talk about that a lot, that we didn't know what questions to ask. So I think taking the help that's offered to you, being able to say, yes, this, these are areas that I need help is so important. I love that you said that. That is key. Yeah. Say yes. <laughs> that, yes. Say yes. Just say yes. yes. Uh, all right. So final question for you, Madeline. Tips that you have for NICU families. How do you help guide them through the NICU? Wow. Um, my first thing that comes to my mind is rally your resources rally your resources, whatever they are for you as a family. Um, People want to help you. And not only, you know, at the formal level of help, as we've talked about case management and how that person can really be a lifeline, an advocate, a facilitator for you, a person who can connect you, but Rally your resources, one of the things. You know, really use those hospital case management services or health plan case management services that are available to you. Assess what how they can help you and ask questions. No question is is a bad question. Um, and trust your gut. You know, I think that's the other thing is to trust your gut. We talked about uh infusing yourself into being a part of the care team, you are a critical part of the care team. Um, If you don't understand something, keep asking questions until you do. I think that is another thing. I think we sometimes ask a question, we get an answer that even confuses us more than the before we started to ask the question. And then you don't want to ask again, because then you're like, well, I don't want to like, I don't want to come off stupid. Um, you are your child's best advocate. And so I think that that is um, another area. And just the last thing I would say is practice self-care when and however you can. Uh, you know, as, as we've talked about, this is such a stressful time in, um, in your family and in your life. And uh, it, it's got, you've got such a big role to play in, in this whole process that you need to find ways also to help to take care of yourself. Very important. That's a long list. <laughs> I, I was jotting them down. So many good, good phrases. Rally your resources, practice self-care, say yes. All good points for NICU families to remember. Madeline, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of this episode. And thanks for doing what you're doing to help so many families. Thank you so much, Martha. I really appreciate it. And and good luck to you and all that you do to help families as well. Thank you. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Life Celebration by Givnesh.